join us in singing our call to worship. Almighty God, we have gathered on this, the third Sunday in Advent. We draw closer to Bethlehem. We draw nearer to the time of Jesus' birth. To be sure, many of us still have things left on our to-do list. In the midst of the chaos of this season, may we not lose sight of you of Jesus, of the manger. May we not lose sight of each other. But God, as we gather for worship, we know that you are here, for you have said, where two or more are gathered, there you shall be also. God, may your Holy Spirit move in this place this morning. Open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear in our hearts that we may truly know and understand all you have to say to us in this place on this beautiful morning. For we offer ourselves in worship in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. As I said, we're gonna now celebrate the sacrament of baptism. If you would turn to page 44 in your hymnal and be prepared to respond in just a little while, I'll now invite Donahue's to come forward as they present their daughter for the sacrament of baptism.
fine right there, buddy. You were just here shortly ago, right? Since I know, right? So what a special morning. It's always a special morning when we have a baptism, and I love baptisms during Advent. And then if you're new with us or haven't been around for some of the other baptisms with this family, uh, Dr. Bob's father was baptized in this gown in this church. Um, and that gown is 103 years old, 105 years old. Um, the traditions of the church are so important. Uh, they, they tie us to one another, and they tie us to something that's bigger than ourselves. And so we give thanks this day for this family and for this beautiful little girl who we will baptize and the wonderful tradition this family has in our church and the ways in which throughout the years they have been the backbone of faithfulness and stewardship. So brothers and sisters in Christ, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs to life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of Jesus Christ, how he said, let the children come unto me, do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. Do you in presenting your child for baptism profess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before your child a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care that she be brought up in the Christian faith, taught the Holy Scriptures, and learn to give reverent attendance upon both the private and public worship of God, will you? And will you further endeavor to keep her under the ministry and guidance of the church till she, by the power of God, shall accept for herself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's Holy Church, will you? Hey, V, will you come see me? You did pretty good before. Oh, hi, sweet girl. Hi, sweet girl. And what name is given this child? Florence Evelyn, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What you think about that, huh? What you think? So this is pretty cool, Evie. A bunch of years ago, a pastor held that guy in this dress and baptized him. And now we're baptizing you. And this is your church family. And as the years go by, they're going to help to make sure this place is around so that you can learn and grow and so that you can be with other children who are learning about Jesus. And each of you will be called upon to be good stewards, to be faithful to this church and to this community so that Evie and all these children that we have been entrusted with might grow in the faith. You'll be called upon to teach them in Sunday school, to be good, set good Christians an example, to surround her mom and dad with love and support so that she can become everything God created her to be. If you're willing to accept that responsibility on behalf of this family, will you please stand and read that part that's in the bull, or in, excuse me, in your hymnal. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Oh my goodness, you did so good. She said, I had it. That preacher, I'm done. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, what a joy it is that to welcome another child into the family of God, this beautiful little girl and her family who have surrounded her, we have made a commitment on her behalf, on behalf of her parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. Oh God, may we not lose sight of our commitment to our children to be there for them, to teach them, to love them, to let them know of your love and your grace and your mercy. Bless this family and bless this little girl, for we offer them to you this day in the name of Christ's child who is to come. Amen. Amen.
you have children with you, I hope you'll let them come down and spend a few minutes with me. Well, good morning, friends. Christmas is getting closer every day. Are you guys getting excited? Yeah. Me too. I'm getting super excited. So if you've been, some of you have been here every week, and we've been lighting the Advent wreath, right? So turn around for me, and you'll know, you'll, and I'm going to need your help. Does anybody remember what, the, what word we used when we lit the first candle that first week? Does anybody remember? But today's joy. So we're, we're yeah, we'll hold that one for a second. Do you remember? No, we had hope. You remember that? We had hope. And then, do we know what we did last week? Does anybody remember? No, we did hope the first week. Love. Boom. There we go. And then Robert, you've already told us what's what's today. Joy. So we light the third candle, the rose candle. Rose-colored candle is our candle for joy. And I told Evie's family that what I really want to do is that the greatest thing that brings me joy is wearing jeans and a T-shirt. And so if I hadn't been, if I didn't have a baptism this morning, I would have preached in jeans and a T-shirt. But you know what else brings me joy? A Charlie Brown Christmas. How many of you have seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? Have all seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? And it's worked so far because several people, before I put my robe on, stopped and they saw my tie and they smiled and they, and they had joy just because of a tie. And then someone asked, well, does it do anything? Well, of course it does something. Look at that. It plays music and Charlie Brown's tree lights up. Did you hear everybody laugh? That's a, that is a, a laughter of joy. They're just simple things that bring us joy. What is one of the things that we do sometimes when we're really excited and happy? What, what, some, what it'll cause you to do sometimes? Yes, ma'am. Um, hug, hug your family. That's a good one. What else do you do? Watch football. football. But like if you get really excited about something, you're really excited, what's an action you do sometimes? Get excited. But when you get excited, what do you do? Yes, ma'am. Smile. Laugh. Does anybody jump? Sometimes you jump, you just get so excited, you jump up in the air, and that's what we get to saying, jump for joy. And in one of our scripture lessons for this morning, there was a, a woman who was expecting a child, and the baby jumped in her belly. It jumped for joy. She says, my baby leapt for joy. And so each of us, sometimes when we are just so filled with excitement and joy, we can't help but to jump and to be thankful and to be grateful. And I'm joyful for each and every one of you and hope that you'll be here next week. We're going to have a wonderful week of, uh, of worship as we are this week. And then I hope everybody will be here Christmas Eve to sing some carols with me and to, to light candles and to be ready for the Christ child to come. Yes, ma'am. You will. Good. You bring some friends. Y'all bow your heads. Y'all pray after me. Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God help us to have your joy in our hearts and share that joy with all we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all can head out to the church and return to sit with your parents.
you'll remain standing with me as we affirm our faith with this beautiful affirmation we've been using during Advent called We Believe. Be printed in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and to make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life and in death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you so much. As I said earlier, several blessings today, and one of those is that um, 
the Stotlers are home with us, and I'm going to invite Elliot and Catherine and Kaysen to come on up. Kaysen, okay, so either way, you're welcome to come on up. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, they are, are missionaries to South Africa. Um, their oldest two daughters are now married and back home in Georgia and Atlanta and coming. Uh, but they continue the good work um, in South Africa, and I will not take their thunder. I will let them tell you about all the wonderful ministry they are doing in South Africa on our behalf and on behalf of many others. Number one. There we go. It is a joy to be with you this morning, to be back in Atlanta first, what we consider to be our home away from home. Um, Elliot and I are involved in several different areas of empowerment. Mine is mostly educational. Elliot is mostly economic, and ours together is spiritual. I have seven different schools that I work with um, each week, and we, um, we sing songs and, and play games and make crafts, and all surrounded by God's creation story, learning more about the world around them and the Lord. So I'll let Elliot tell you what he does. My area of ministry is economic uh, empowerment, and uh, many of the people in the area that we are in, a rural area, are very impoverished, and so our uh, empowerment ministries focus on providing business skills so that they can start small businesses. Some of them are agriculturalists, some of them uh, you know, make uh, fabrics and, uh, and clothing and sell them within their communities. We provide them not just business skills, but we also provide scripturally based lifestyle and character skills so that their businesses are God-centered and uh, hopefully will be much more successful because of that. And that's been what we've done uh, for the last two years. We also started a microloan program so that uh, person who, let's say, wants to sew dresses can purchase a used sewing machine and get started in business, and then they pay back that loan uh, throughout the time that we're studying uh, God's Word together. And then uh, the next thing we're going to focus on the coming next year is very exciting for us. One of the things that uh, our area of ministry uh, struggles with is poverty, and many of the pastors in our area uh, do not have formal educations. They're very passionate about what they do and that they want to share the gospel, but they really don't have the training to be able to do that. And so we are partnering with a local church who has a vision for strengthening uh, the local pastors in order to uh, develop the kingdom better throughout our area. And so we will be uh, developing a training center. We're actually building a, uh, a classroom building um, so that we can use that as a training center to teach both pastors as well as church leaders from about a 2,000 square kilometer area uh, that we serve in. So they will come um, and spend, we actually have a dormitory there already where they will come spend time living on the site um, and studying the Word and uh, learning much more about being effective pastors and empowering the lay people within their churches. So that's upcoming in the next year. We're very excited about that. That's a, a way that we can multiply our efforts throughout many different churches as opposed to just a couple that we're able to work with. But we're happy to be here today, first and foremost, so that we can express our appreciation to each one of you and to the church Atlanta First uh, for their support throughout the year. Um, they've been one of our initial supporters and make a huge difference in what we're able to do while we're uh, about our kingdom work in South Africa. Um, but it's, it's more than just the financial support. We know that when we come here, uh, we find uh, support and encouraging words from each one of you, and we take that with us throughout the year as we go about our ministry activities. Just remembering you individually and remembering how much uh, you have supported us and been a part of our walk for these many years. So thank you so much for having us here today. Before you go, so the, I didn't ask you this. This, so this is a dangerous thing for a preacher to do. You mentioned the folks that you're in ministry with and the poverty there. But then you talked about these pastors and their, their incredible uh, passion for ministry. Sunday on which we discuss joy. In the midst of that, do you find joy? And if so, what does that look like in the context of ministry that you find yourself? Um, resilience, um, smiles on faces. Um, these folks don't have a lot, but they're very happy with what they have. They're happy that their children are healthy. They're happy that their children have a school to go to. Um, some of them have jobs, and they're happy that they have a job so that they can um, help support their family. Um, just immense joy. We also find uh, that most of what our ministry is all about is developing relationships. And, and out of those relationships, we never know quite what's going to happen. 
Um, and so we have a lot of surprises uh, uh, when the light bulb goes on or when we get an embrace for somebody, when somebody invites us into their home. Um, that's the joy that we find in our ministry is when we see God at work, in their lives, and in the lives of the relationships that we've been able to form with them. So that brings us great joy, and it gets us through the challenging times, which there are a few here and there. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we also see joy in their, uh, in their eyes, uh, their hopefulness, their joy. Uh, they can take uh, any small occasion to, uh, to sing a song or, or, or have a dance or something. Um, that just shows their joyfulness. Great. Thank you all so much. We all give them a warm welcome. Isn't it? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I suspected I knew the answer to that question, at least in part. Um, and we'll, we'll hit that a little bit more here in just a few moments as we prepare for our all right, as we prepare for our um, scripture lesson and, and our sermon, I want to direct you to our prayer list that's on the back of your bulletin. Um, we did celebrate the life of Ann Taylor yesterday. Ann was a longtime member of our congregation and uh, died earlier this week. Had a beautiful service yesterday at, at the chapel at Turner and Sons and um, wonderful family who expressed their appreciation to this church for uh, for our love and support. You'll see the other prayer requests there. If you have other celebrations or concerns you'd like to share with us and invite you to find the prayer request cards that are located in the pew back in front of you and fill those out. You can uh, follow the sermon. We'll have the offering and the opportunity for you to place those in the offering plate or you can certainly uh, hand it to me uh, following the service so that we might be praying for you and with you. I'm gonna share a number of scripture lessons this morning, but as I alluded to with the children, the one that we will share to begin with is kind of the... the um, the prequel, if you will, to what we read last week. Last week we read from the Magnificat, Mary's hymn uh, about and to her son. But we're gonna back up a little bit. We read a little bit of this last week, but we're gonna back up a little bit um, in the first chapter of Luke to the 39th verse. And out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's word, I invite you to stand as you're able. Mary visits Elizabeth. And in those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Think with me for a few moments this morning, leaping for joy. So I wake up every morning with joy. I go to bed every night with joy. You see, that's Shannon's middle name, Shannon Joy. <laughs> so most of the time, I find myself surrounded by joy. Her middle name comes from her aunt, who is Joy, and so... I got a good laugh out of that. That was good. Good way to start a sermon on joy. She does bring a lot of joy, as does my son and my mom and our family and our friends. Catherine and Elliot talked about joy in a very difficult context. I've been um, on one international mission trip and a, and a number of other mission opportunities. And often when we go on these trips, they're more than likely than not, going to be in impoverished areas. My one trip several years ago was to Honduras, and we went to a village uh, not far from a ranch that's owned by a local ministry here called HOI, Honduras Outreach. We went to that ranch that over the years has been, or we went to that village that over the years has had schools and facilities built by the ministries of HOI. The wonderful thing I love about HOI and the same thing about what Ellie and Catherine are doing is there's, there's a consistency there. 
We don't have folks going in and out and, you know, one, one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. When you're going to have long-term impact in the mission field, there must be consistency and continuity. You must have folks like the Stotlers on the ground who begin to immerse themselves in the culture, understanding the true needs of the people. Americans kind of like to go and, and build buildings and lay brick and feel good about ourselves when that's not always what they need. Sometimes what they need are a few dollars to buy a sewing machine and some fabric. And, and, and the, the values that we have aren't necessarily the values that they share. But I never will forget the first day that the children came to us as we were sharing a vacation Bible school with them. And the incredible joy that I saw on their faces. Even within this group of children, there was kind of a spectrum of socioeconomics. Even in the country of Honduras, there were some children whose uniform shirts, these children in Honduras had uniforms that they wore to school. Some of their shirts were white and crisp, clear that they had had the opportunity to be washed and kept clean and ironed. Whereas other children's shirts were dingy and dirty and worn and tattered. But across that entire spectrum, they would come every day with smiles on their faces and they would leap for joy as we played games and even through the language barrier, we would see this incredible joy on their eye, in their eyes and in their hearts. Catherine alluded to it a little bit, I think, and, and, um, and I think one of those things that brings them such great joy is a contentment with what they have. And, and, and we, we know the saying, ignorance is bliss, sometimes not knowing what we don't have can help us to appreciate what we do have. Now, hear me clearly. I'm not suggesting that, that we want a world in which children live without the basic necessities. But what I am saying is that in those places in the world where folks do have something to eat and, and a roof over their head and a family around them, even if they don't live in the largest of homes or have the latest, greatest gadgets, maybe in spite or in, because of that, they have incredible joy that comes with a contentment that brings about peace. And so this morning we start, and there's several, as I said, several scriptures that I want to share with us this morning about this and a couple of quotes that I think are particularly important. And, and so, um, and so I, will, I will share all of these with you in an effort that as we make our way through these final days of Advent, as we look toward the day of Christmas, we continue to get our priorities straight. We continue to be ready to be ready. Several years ago, I, I had a sermon titled, Fixing to Get Ready what we do in the South. We're fixing to. So we, we join this wonderful reunion with Mary and Elizabeth. And no sooner than, than Elizabeth hears Mary greet her, this child in her room, womb leaps for joy. It was interesting. I, I, I wanted to just Google joy. I, I wanted to see if I put in Google what joy was because you, we all, most of us who know anything about the internet and know anything about search engines know a couple of things. There are two ways that, uh, that, that, that uh, results are returned in a search engine. One is people pay for those results to be returned. Um, they pay for the ability to have their, their whatever they're promoting to be first. The second thing we know is that it's how many times people have searched for that and what they have searched for. If, if you've ever had a question about something and you start typing it into Google, you will know that Google will recognize that and you'll realize how many other people have asked that exact same question. It was fascinating, last week there was an article about the most frequent Googled health terms. It seems that, uh, I lost, there's Dr. Bob, it seems we've all become bedside doctors now. We want to all diagnose ourselves. And so um, before we go to WebMD, we'll type in, what is this rash on my arm? And when you start typing in something, I promise you it will auto-populate because there are other people who have asked 
that same question. So I typed in joy. The first thing that came up I was not aware is there's a movie named Joy that comes out Christmas Day uh, starring Jennifer Lawrence and Robert De Niro, I think, and, um, and it's about a multi-generation family, and it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of joy in the movie from the plot synopsis. But being a blockbuster film with, a, with a, uh, an actress who commands attention in Hollywood, the first handful of, of returns on that on my search for joy, we're all about that movie. But then, you know, if you've searched in Google recently, then the next thing that you see are images associated with joy. And all of the first handful of images were of people in the air leaping for joy. We're in the height of football season. And over the weekend, we had state championship football games. And in every occasion when that clock would strike zero, the team that had won, the first thing that those players do is they leap as they make their way onto the field to join their teammates. And they continue to leap and jump and embrace. Yesterday afternoon, it's been several years since I've watched the Army-Navy game. It was a great game yesterday afternoon, a well-fought game. Um, I, I, I feel Army's pain. Um, my yellow jackets have lost um, 16 out of 21 times to the University of Georgia, and, and Army has lost 13 straight to their arch rival, Navy. Navy had these incredible helmets that were hand-painted. I think there were seven different themes on their helmets. and. And the game was great, but at the end, well, first at the beginning, the tradition and the pageantry, and then at the end, they each sing their alma mater. And the players were leaping up to the stands to be held by the midshipmen and the cadets as together they sang their institution's alma mater. It was incredible pageantry and tradition And what was incredible is there was joy in the eyes of both the losers and the winners because at the end of the day, they all knew that they were on the same team once the game was over. I hope that all of you at some point in your life, if not frequently, have had the opportunity to leap for joy. To me, there's no greater feeling that comes from just pure joy. I have these, these, these feelings all the time, and I joked around about Shannon, but I think in spite of the fact that I spend a lot of my time around Shannon Joy, I do my best throughout the course of the day to find joy in other ways. I think it's shared with some of you that I ran the, the Thanksgiving Day 5K and I knew, it was, I knew I felt good. I knew it was a beautiful morning. I knew that, that things were kind of in a good place. But I crossed the finish line, and I looked down at my watch, and I had set a PR. And there was just a smile that I, I mean, there was, I'm by myself. I wasn't running with anybody. I'm by myself, by myself, in the fact that I didn't know anybody around me. Others were continuing to flood past me as they finished, but I, I had this sense of joy, of accomplishment, of a goal, of something that I had set forth. The greater joy came a couple of weeks later when um, uh, it's Facebook, last, y'all were so kind last week to sing happy birthday. I had a wonderful birthday. I had a wonderful birthday afternoon that included varsity in the golf course. It doesn't really get a whole lot better than that. Um, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, and so... One of, the, one of the expressions of greeting was from Dr. Lewis Birdseye, who you've heard me speak of before. He was my 10th grade English teacher and my cross-country coach in 11th grade. And Dr. Birdseye is, uh, being an English teacher and, a, and a, an incredible um, master of the English language, wrote more beautifully than what I'm going to say, but essentially he said... Um, Good young men become, or good, 
good students and good people like you become good men later in lives. What he said gave me far more credit, but the fact that over these many years, and he lives in Oregon and over these many miles, to receive a greeting like that from him brought me incredible joy. Now, I've talked about receiving joy, but, but we, also, we also use our joy or we, we're called upon to bring joy to others. There were a couple of quotes that I found, both from Mother Teresa, and one was, joy is prayer, joy is strength, and joy is love, and joy is a net of love by which you can catch souls. I, I've got a whole collection of Christmas ties. Some of them are fancy, some of them are, are goofy. But this morning, several of you got caught in the net of joy when you saw my tie and I saw you smile. I promise you that if, if one Sunday, instead of me preaching, we just showed a Charlie Brown Christmas, we'd probably have a packed house. There's something about this, this gloomy little character who, who brings out the best in all of us. And we love things that we... Press buttons and, uh-oh, there it goes. The battery's wearing out. Promise you, whether it's this tie or one of my other Christmas ties, I wear them, one, I think they look nice, but two, I cannot tell you the number of people who will stop and look and ask and smile. In Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, the, Paul's letter to the Galatians, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And I love, I love this for a couple of reasons. In Galatians 5, verse 22, he's contrasting the things that aren't fruit of the Spirit, but we're staying on a positive note tonight, so I'm not gonna do this morning. I'm not gonna talk about what he says before, but he says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, second only to love, is joy. And the only reason he leads with love is earlier he says, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Y'all are probably tired of me preaching about that, but it really is the bedrock. And if you, if you just distill down the gospel to its very basic core, love God and love neighbor is all the gospel is telling us. And so... By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then this is my favorite part. There is no law against any of these things. There is no law against any of these things. So you asked me the question, made me ask the question, why do we have laws? Primarily in a civil society, we have laws to help order society and primarily so that we don't hurt others and others don't hurt us. And what Paul is saying is that you're never going to get hurt or hurt someone else if you're practicing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. No one is going to get hurt with any of that. And in recent weeks, as we have seen tragedy after tragedy, if we have seen the chaos that seems to dominate the world... I continue to believe that if we will spend time doing the cans instead of worrying about the cans, then I think some of this other stuff will take care of itself. The reason there is no law against these things is because no one will get hurt when these things are being practiced. The second quote from Mother Teresa, joy is a sign of generosity when you are full of joy, you move faster and you want to go about doing good to everyone. When you are full of joy, you move faster and want to go about doing good to everyone. We have all known people who are so joyful that they just don't seem to slow down. When they are truly content and happy and joyful about what they're doing, they want to go from one part of the task to the next. 
and they spend their days tirelessly trying to do good for others. If you've ever experienced that joy in another person, you just want a little bit of that. You want somehow, some way to capture that joy to live into that joy and to share that joy with others. One of those places we see that joy most evident is in children. The unbridled joy that comes from the most simple of things. And as we get older, it's not things that bring us joy, but it's people and memories. My final word on joy for this morning. One of the things that brings me joy is great memories. I reached in my, on my shelf of Bibles. I've got two full shelves of paper hardback Bibles. I got a whole bunch of them in here too, but, but there's something wonderful about an old school King James Version red letter edition. The bumper sticker says, if the KJV was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and we know that Jesus didn't speak the king's English and probably didn't look a whole lot like the king. But this particular King James version of the Bible was given to me on Christmas Day, 1983 by some dear friends, Kathy and John. Kathy lived in my grandmother's apartments. Uh, she lived downstairs, um, just a wonderful, wonderful soul. Um, and she married John and um, it, it, wonderful, dear friends. One, one of the stories that brings me joy is that when Kathy died, John wanted a one single rose for her, um, for her memorial service. And, and my mom, being, the, being frugal as she is, that's one way to say cheap, um, went by Kroger and got the cheapest red rose she could find. And after the memorial service, John comes to her and says, thank you so much for getting this rose. Now, if you will find a company who preserves it, I would like it preserved and framed. So that $2 rose, we spent another $500 to have preserved and framed so that he would have that in perpetuity. So Kathy and John gave me this King James red letter edition on Christmas 1983. And since I'm wearing the tie this morning, we'll join Linus on stage and Charlie Brown in his frustration asks, doesn't anyone know what Christmas is all about? And Linus says, reading from or reciting from Luke's gospel. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not. And as Linus says, fear not, he's held on to his blue blanket, his trusty blanket, that blanket brings him peace as he says, fear not, he drops his trusty blanket because he has nothing to fear. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and singing. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be all people. That is the true meaning of Christmas, Charlie Brown at which point Charlie Brown has the purest smile of joy as he grabs that little scraggly tree and walks out the side of the school auditorium. May God's joy be with you as we continue on our journey to Bethlehem. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for this season. We give you thanks for joy. May we know joy. May we share joy. May we see joy. May we be joy. We pray for those who protect us. We pray for those who mourn. We give thanks for those who bring us joy. And oh God, we give thanks for the greatest gift the world has ever known. We bring our prayers and we offer now our gifts. In the name of Christ who taught us to pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.